All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Laura Roxbury. If you don't know me, I'm an investigator in the Hartford Regional Office and my partner in crime today is attorney Meg Grant, Megan Grant from our um, legal department. Um, and today we want to talk, you know, in honor of Women's History Month, we thought it would be interesting to talk about an incident a mother and daughter who were political activists who really made a difference in their community and whose impact we are still really feeling today. Um, you would probably not be familiar with the mom, Martha Bell Sipuel, but you might know her daughter if you, which would mean you know, are familiar with her lawsuit. So Ada Lois Sipuel, and she went by Lois, so we're going to call her Lois today, which is actually her middle name, but uh, Lois was the plaintiff in a suit that successfully desegregated the University of Oklahoma Law School. And so we're going to start out. Today um, with a little bit of an overview of the case, so take it away. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. I'm Meg. Like Laura said, thanks for being here today. Um, this is a really great topic. I think a lot of times when we sort of talk about case law, at least I know this from going to law school, it's very technical and there's really not a lot of information given about the personal experiences of the people who went through these lawsuits. Um, and this is especially true in cases that involve civil rights, where the plaintiffs in these cases experienced a lot of trauma from being the test plaintiffs. Um, with respect to desegregation in public schools especially. Um, so with that, I'm just going to give a quick sort of background of kind of um, what the segregation laws were in the South when this case happened. Um, so here we can sort of see um, outside of the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall, who was the head attorney on this case for the NAACP. Um, and then all the way to the right is Ada Lois Sipwell Fisher. Um, and so Fisher's her married name. Um, and so now we can, yep, so the next slide. So at the time that this lawsuit happened, it was prior to Brown v. Board of Education, which was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954. Um, and it was actually one of the cases that paved the way to Brown, um, even though it's less talked about than Brown. Um, but at this time, the sort of law of the land was Plessy v. Ferguson, which was this idea of separate but equal. Um, and the southern states in particular, um, they really sort of carried this idea of separate but equal into almost every single facet of life. Um, so with respect to Oklahoma, they were under the Territorial School Code of 1897 and the Oklahoma Constitution of 1907, and both of those laws um, required segregation in public schools and in pretty much every other place of public accommodation. Um, and they actually made it a misdemeanor for somebody to teach in an integrated school setting and for other folks to go to a school that was separately designated for a race that that person was not. Um, in terms of where Oklahoma School of Law was located, it was located in Norman, Oklahoma, um, which at that time was also a sundown town. Um, and it actually remained a sundown town all the way through 1965, according to many of the professors who worked there. There were signs on either side of Main Street until 1965 that explicitly said that it was a sundown town. Um, so this is sort of the environment that this case kind of comes up in. Um, so the NAACP decided that they were going to take a crusade. They were going to sort of mount a crusade against school segregation. Um, and so I see also questions popping up in the chat, and I just want to know want to note that we'll get to those questions. Um, we have a lot to get through, and as Laura said, I talk a lot, so <laughs> I'm going to do my best <laughs> to get through some of our slides, and then I'll address questions if people have. Um, but so one of the first sort of cases in the NAACP's fight was Missouri XRL Gaines v. Canada, and that case sort of took on this idea um, of this kind of 
dual education system that southern states had developed. So under their charters, they could either choose to have two, a segregated program in a state school, or they could choose to set aside adequate provisions to finance tuition for black folks in an adjacent state. So it was essentially financing education, but in another state because they did not want to educate black folks in their state schools. Um, so that was the issue in Missouri Extral Games with Canada. The US Supreme Court said this is not equal education. Um, so they didn't really sort of confront the idea of separate but equal because they found that this arrangement with educating people in an adjacent school was just not equal. Um, so after this happened, um, the plaintiff in Gaines had quit his job in anticipation of finally being accepted to the law school after it was successful. Um, and but relief wasn't as swift as he wanted because Missouri just decided that they were going to, instead of integrate and accept him into the pre-existing school, they were going to now create a whole new school um, for black folks because they wanted to make, keep it very segregated. Um, and so after this, he ended up quitting his he ended up just never being heard from again, the plaintiff in Gaines. Um, so this is sort of evidence of the toll that this kind of stuff takes on these test case plaintiffs. And the NAACP really needed people who were going to sort of weather the storm as they continued their crusade. It was their plan to file multiple test cases that would challenge this all across the country. Um, so the NAACP identified Lois's brother, um, Lemuel Sipple, to serve as a test plaintiff in the OU Law School case, um, but he didn't want to serve as test plaintiff because he had recently come back from fighting in World War II and he was ready to start his life. Um, so he actually ended up going to Howard Law School um, and he actually ended up graduating from Howard Law School before Lois even got admitted to OU. Um, so that just kind of shows how long the process took. So she decided that she was going to volunteer to be the test plaintiff. Um, after, you know, going through some interviews with the NAACP legal team, they said, yes, you're the person for us. And she ended up applying to OU Law School on January 14th of 1946. And then she was rejected um, solely because of her race, because the school didn't accept black folks. Um, so there's some technical stuff with respect to what exactly happened amongst the courts, but ultimately it makes its way to the Supreme Court, um, to the US Supreme Court, and they essentially decide that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment, the, this arrangement, and that her denial is unconstitutional. Um, so they order the state of Oklahoma to secure legal education afforded by a state institution. Um, and they say that the state must provide it for in conformity with the Equal Protection Clause and provide it as soon as it does for applicants of any other group. But you'll notice it doesn't say explicitly whether the, whether OU needs to admit her into the pre-existing school or whether it can create another separate school. So rather than admit her to the pre-existing school, the Attorney General instead instructs OU to create a completely separate law school just for black students, and that's called Langston University School of Law, and it's thrown together in five days. Um, so clearly we can know that that's definitely not going to be a substantively equal school, considering the fact that it is put together in five days. Um, Lois rejects this option and she says this is not equal. Um, so she then applies again to OU School of Law um, and the school again denies her admission. But this time they say, well, here she has a she has an equal opportunity because this other law school exists for her. So, you know, we're in compliance with what the court ordered in in this case. So there's no issue here. Um, and so after this, um, after this, well, at the same time as this, there have been six other African American students who have applied to OU, um, and this is as part of the NAACP's whole overall strategy. And one of those individuals is um, McLaurin, George McLaurin, and so he applies to get his PhD in education. Um, and in October of 1948, a panel of three federal judges finds, based on the first, based on Sipwell's case, um, that Oklahoma University had to provide him with the opportunities necessary to pursue a PhD um, in educational administration. So OU admits 
McLaurin on October 13, 1948. Although it's on a segregated basis, given the economic reality for the school of having to create a separate graduate school for every single program that black folks have tried to apply to. Um, his case gets all appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, and that becomes another one of the big Supreme Court cases that gets used to support the court's reversal of Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown v. Board of Education. Um, and it's interesting too to just sort of think about Lois's fight as all this is going on. Um, you know, she still was not admitted while McLaurin got admitted to OU. Um, even though her lawsuit is what paved the way for him to ultimately be admitted to the same school. Um, and so with the threat of, you know, her case returning to the Supreme Court and actually substantively challenging separate but equal and the sort of sham law school that was Langston running out of funds, um, OU finally admits her to the law school um, in 1949. And then after a very long, beautiful career in teaching, um, she ends up becoming one of the regents of OU in 1992 to sort of come full circle. So one of the reasons that the NAACP went to the Sitville family in the first place is because they were familiar with them. They were very active in their community and in politics and in, and in the NAACP. Um, and so that's one of the reasons they went and picked them for, to try to recruit one of their children to serve. Um, the Sipules weren't originally from Chickasha. They were originally lived, in, they lived in Tulsa before that. And they were actually victims of the Tulsa race massacre. Her father was a minister and they had a church in Tulsa. So the Reverend Sipule was one of the men that was detained during the race massacre. Uh, their house burned down, their church was burned down. And after he was freed, they decided in 1921, we're not going to stay in Tulsa. So they relocated to a little town called Chickasha, which is, if you can see on the map, it's a little southwest of Oklahoma City. And in 1930, Chickasha is the location of what is considered the last kind of official lynching in Oklahoma. A young man named Henry Argo, who was 19 years old, also intellectually impaired, goes fishing one day and a white woman who lived near where he was fishing accused him of sexually assaulting her. Argo is arrested and taken to the jail and a crowd starts to build outside of the jail wanting to, you know, calling for his release. They want to lynch him. And so the National Guard was actually deployed to the site and a skirmish breaks out. The crowd actually manages to get into the jail and Argo is shot. For bizarre reasons, um, the sheriff is a white guy named Matt Sankey, elects not to take Argo to get medical care. He leaves him in the jail and then he begins allowing quote unquote visitors into the jail, many of whom are part of the mob who come in to visit Argo. And so he is shot and stabbed multiple times in the jail while he's in the custody of the sheriff. Ultimately, they do take him to the hospital where he passes away. No one was ever held accountable for um, his murder. Uh, but Lois's mom, Mar Martha Bell Sipuel, everybody called her Big Mama. OK, so Big Mama Sipuel is outraged by what happened. Matt Sankey is up for re-election that year, and she decides to make it her mission to make sure that Matt Sankey pays the price for what he's done. And so this is one of my all time favorite uh, political campaign slogans. <laughs> she takes a bed sheet and on the side of it she paints to hell with Matt Sankey. She hangs it from the side of their car and she drives it all around town and she stirs up opposition to Sankey and he does in fact lose the election and he passes away the next year. I took this story and a lot of the other ones that we're talking about from Lois's um, autobiography, which you can see on the left side, A Matter of Black and White. She wrote that with her son, who's a historian. Um, so we unfortunately with women, a lot of times whenever you're talking about the issue, you can't just talk about their qualities, their qualifications or their skills. You also have to talk about their appearance. And in this case, we have to talk about Big Mama's appearance in part because it's really important to Lois. 
here's a picture of the big mama and her after she won her elect her her court case and then also one of the Sipuel families um as you can see martha bell is big mama is looks white right um and that's a thing that lois actually talks a lot about in her biography so her mom was mixed race she was descended from slaves and um it means a lot to her that her mom who could have easily passed right and avoided the indignities of segregation and a lot of the problems that they experienced as a black family that she could have elected to just pass and in fact people often consider her white um, people actually try to rescue her from the race massacre because they thought she was a white lady who gotten lost in north tulsa and then you know lois tells the story about traveling with her mom on the trains and they're sitting in what's designated as the colored section and she's sitting there with her mom and they're like oh you need to move this is for black folks you know and instead of doing that her mom actually embraces the fact that under the oklahoma constitution if you have one drop of african blood so to speak that that makes you a black person and, and her mom did not run from that in fact she embraced it and it meant something to lois that she did that and opted to choose a man who was very dark skinned and raise her family and take on causes like henry argo so uh her her grandson her son bruce fisher tells the story about you know just having a picture of his grandma which he thought of as his grandma on his desk and people saying oh who's the white lady he said that's not a white lady that's my grandma so the fact that she elected to embrace that identity and take on the fight, her it really meant a lot and inspired a lot to uh, inspire Lois in her fight. Her father actually passed away right after she filed her suit, and her mom is a big source of emotional support for her throughout her fight, and that's obviously where she gets a lot of her um, her gumption and her her drive. So when we talk about Big Mama, we're talking about her appearance because it's an inspiration to Lois, but Meg's going to talk about Lois's appearance and how that was an issue for her. Yeah, so even though she was clearly at the center of this case and she was the one who volunteered to sort of put her life on hold to for the greater good, in a sense, to be the test plaintiff in this case, um, she was very much sort of in the background when it came to press about this case um, and she was characterized by the press in a very gendered way um, so even when there were conferences that had to do with her case and the progression of her case she was on, often only the female there um, and usually only the, the only black female there um, and in later interviews um, Lois's son described sort of the sexist undertones that she faced during her fight even from people who were on the NAACP legal team, um, including who would become Justice Thurgood Marshall, um, who referred to her often as girly. That was what he called her. That was what he called Lois. Um, and so, you know, as other schools and other states were sort of admitting black students and OU wasn't during this time period of like 1948 through 1950, um, you know, it was difficult for Lois. She felt that she was fighting this fight and was frustrated that that changes weren't happening more quickly. Um, and whenever she would sort of show this frustration, Marshall would tell her, quote, girly, we're just building a record. Um, so, you know, that was very dismissive, um, especially given what she had risked for this case. Um, and you know another example is that it was sort of expected that lois would be in charge of getting lunch for the all-male naacp legal team um and so again referring to her as girly um you know lois's son remembers him saying to her now girly i'm going to argue this case but from now on you're in charge of the bologna sandwiches um and so again very dismissive it was very clear sort of what they felt her role was, um, you know, she also ultimately the church ladies ended up providing the bologna sandwiches. <laughs> it wasn't Lois. <laughs> um, but, you know, the NAACP had Roscoe Dungy also responded um, when a reporter sort of questioned it, um, saying that, you know, we don't permit her to speak at these rallies. Um, so that Papers also talked about sort of her clothes and appearance, um, but meanwhile, there was really no coverage of male civil rights activists um, appearance or, you know, especially with respect to the fedoras that Thurgood Marshall wore. 
Um, you know, she she was referred to as sort of pretty and non-threatening. Um, and at the time, OU President George Cross also referred to her as, quote, chic, charming and well poised. Um, so it was very clear the type of picture that the press was trying to paint with respect to Lois. Um, they were trying to minimize sort of her strength and um, in the way that they characterized her with these kind of gendered terms. Um, and then in sort of talking about the overlap of kind of race and gender, um, Lois also received a ton of hate mail for her involvement in this case, um, even to the point where if there was a letter addressed to, you know, Ada, Ada Lois Tipple Fisher or um, N-word Oklahoma, it would be delivered to her house um, by the by the Postal Service. Um, and, you know, some of the terms that people used to describe her in those letters were very gendered. Um, one of the, you know, offensive terms that is most remembered is, quote, stringy haired, tall, skinny, sallow faced negress. So that's obviously very gendered and racialized. Um, so I think one one more quick thing too, and I know I'm talking a lot, Laura, um, but one of the things I found interesting was that um, in sort of the way that she characterized herself in later interviews, um, she saw herself as a contributor to the quote, social engineers, um, who she deemed to be kind of the male NAACP legal team. So she didn't see herself necessarily as a social engineer for her role in these things, but she saw herself as contributing to that. So I thought that was a sort of interesting um, perspective and I uh, just wanted to talk about that. So in 1995, Lois passed away from cancer. Um, and that same year, the University of Oklahoma set up a garden memorial to honor her for her um, contributions to the university. Oklahoma has 77 counties. They collected stones from each of the 77 counties and used those to build a stone fountain that would be in the center of it. At the bottom of it, there's an inscription that reads, in Psalm 118, the psalmist speaks of how the stone that the builders once rejected, sorry, that the stone that was once rejected becomes the cornerstone. And I'm sorry, Lois and her mom really do serve as an inspiration to future generations and other women, female activists um, in the community, one of whom is a lady named Claire Looper, who is well-known activist in Oklahoma. She gained access to the University of Oklahoma also as part of Lois's suit. And um, she, she was very active in the NAACP offices in Oklahoma City. She led a group of students to New York City um, for a visit where they got to experience what it was like to be in the town that was not segregated for the first time. And they said, we should do this in Oklahoma. So two years before the young men sat in in Greensboro, North Carolina, Clara Lupa was reading, leading a group of students to desegregate public places in Oklahoma City. They started with the Cat um, drugstore and they moved on from there. It spread to Tulsa and that really kind of kicked off desegregation in Tulsa. So, you know, Lois's effect was immediate on other activists, but she also continued to have an effect as it went on. You know, she's trying to apply to the law school, we flash forward um, and you get Anita Hill, who is actually serving, you know, she's a professor at the law school. And of course, probably most of you remember that during Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearing in front of the Senate in 1991, Anita Hill speaks out and, uh, you know, um, gives information that he had sexually harassed her while she worked for him. And this is about the same time that Lois gets appointed to be a regent to the university and her support is very significant in helping protect Anita. There was a lot of push, political push to, um, you know, terminate Anita Hill's employment and kind of run her out. And um, Lois was very influential in helping to protect her. She would actually show up to the Board of Regent meetings wearing her pink, I believe, Anita Hill button. So um, her support meant a lot. Anita has given uh, um, uh, interviews where she's mentioned specifically that Loa's mentorship really inspired her, gave her strength and helped carry her through. 
And so just sort of in line with the legacy that she's kind of left is this concept that black women are really at the forefront um, of, you know, educational advocacy. And we see this throughout the entire civil rights movement and all the way through, um, you know, even in, in this century um, and in Connecticut. Um, and so, you know, if we look at the people who have been really the main plaintiffs in a lot of these really important education cases, um, you know, starting with Linda Brown, who was the plaintiff in um, Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, which overturned separate but equal and really kicked off the whole integration movement, um, you know, to Ruby Bridges, who um, was sort of integral in the New Orleans integration crisis of 1960. She was one of the first people to go and try and integrate the school um, after the, you know, orders came down from the Supreme Court to integrate all of the schools. Um, Elizabeth Eckford, who was one of the Little Rock Nine in 1957 to integrate an all-white high school there. Um, and then we have Elizabeth Horton Sheff, who's from Connecticut, um, who was the plaintiff in Sheff v. O'Neill, which was about racial segregation in our schools, um, which was decided in 1996 and the settlement improved in 2020. Um, but all of these women really have just sort of taken the lead on desegregation in public education um, and you know, racial equity in education as a general matter. Um, and, you know, that really a lot of that started with SIP, with the SIP walls and, and with this case. Um, so, you know. And we want to recognize that, you know, in the background of all this, as we're talking about this today, the Senate is hearing confirmation about whether or not we're going to get our first female. We are going to get our first black female Supreme Court justice. And we wanted to recognize that there's a connection there between the fight that uh, Lois had and her inspiration from her mother to what we are um, have today. Thank you for joining us. We thought if we have time, I know we ran long. If you do have questions and you wanna hang around or comments, we are glad to stop to, um, to answer questions if you have them. All right, Great job, ladies. Thank you so much for the presentation. So informative and well presented. I wanted to say the same thing <laughs> that this was uh, really good information. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the work that went into <clears throat> putting it together. Um, and yeah, it was really just really informative. <laughs> Excuse me. And I think this is a good addition to what we do in terms of educating ourselves. And I don't know if we have external participants too, but this was really good. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we got questions. Okay, Sundown Town, I think that got answered. Um, I think that's the only question, really. There's like so much we could have talked about. It was hard to leave everything out because it's such a fascinating story. And I'd, I'd love to talk about, you know, the other students and their response and the segregation that she experienced at OU and all of her experiences with that. I mean, there's just like a lot to talk about. And, um, you know, but you just don't have time to talk about it all. It's, 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 a, it's a really interesting case. I did put a couple of links at the top of the chat if you're interested in more information. One goes to um, OU has a website, a web page that kind of gives a photo essay and a little synopsis of what happened if you're interested in reading that. And the other link is to an oral history with her son where he talks about a lot of these stories that we we got so that, um, oh, you can't see them? Okay. Er. I can I can redo them. I think oh, Spencer there. just put them in, yeah. All right, so there's that. And then also, if you're interested to, again, her, her autobiography that she wrote is A Matter of Black and White, and you can find that as well. Um, if you're interested in reading more, she's a very fascinating lady. And thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Friday.